All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. How's everyone? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you for tuning into our Maintain Right series. Tonight, we are going to talk about cost effective energy improvements for your historic home. My name is Anna Pernis. I'm the Director of Conservation and Education at the PRC. I am joined by Dr. Claudette Hanks Reichel, a professor and extension housing specialist with the Louisiana State University Ag Center. She serves as director of the La House Resource Center, a demonstration house exhibiting multiple high performance and housing solutions and a hub of extension education programs to advance resource efficient, durable and healthy housing for the Southern climate and natural hazards. Uh, Dr. Reichel has developed numerous educational outreach programs and resources relating to housing, including energy efficiency, healthy homes, hurricane and flood resilience, and others. She has authored more than 100 extension publications and presented at numerous professional events, um, was twice featured, was a twice featured speaker at the National Building Museum in Washington, DC, and has received 12 national and state level awards for program excellence and impact. Thank you again for joining us. Um, before we begin, I just have a few notes. Uh, the PRC is proud to present the Maintain Right series to be a resource for homeowners to empower them with the knowledge they need to spot potential problems in their historic houses and find ways to address them, including who to call when the, when the problem requires a professional. With the generous support of the Louisiana State Historic Preservation Office and the Joanna Favreau Fund for Historic Preservation of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Maintain Right will be launching a new website, free classes, and short videos through our social media and YouTube. I also want to say thank you to all of our members and donors of the PRC who make our work to preserve New Orleans historic architecture, neighborhoods, and cultural identity possible. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and rely on the support of our members and donors to do the work to protect the authenticity of our historic city. This June, we are also hosting our Shop and House Month. Uh, please make sure to check out our event schedule at the PRCNO.org to find our tour dates and trivia nights. Uh, we are asking that viewers of the Shotgun House Month consider a donation of $25, but any amount makes a difference. You can donate at our website. All donations taken in during the Shotgun House Month will go directly to fund the PRC's Innovative Revival Grants Program, which makes free historic home repairs for low-income families in the Tremaine neighborhood. While you're on our website, check out our PRC's fun merchandise, which is on sale all month for 20% 20 per, 20 off. There's t-shirts, books, masks. Um, you could find it all on the website. And if you are not already a member, please consider joining. Um, finally, I just wanna say that you can see us, but we can't see you. So please make sure to submit your questions anytime during the discussion via the Q&A or the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I will be monitoring the questions and get a chance to relay them at the end of the discussion. Again, thank you all for joining us tonight. And I'm gonna give it over to Dr. Reichel and let her share her screen and move on with her presentation. Thank you. Okay, let's get the slideshow to start. There we go. Do you see it? Yep, we got it. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, come on, Savai, everybody. I'm I'm a Cajun from South Louisiana, and um, I'm just delighted to be asked to share some information with you today about energy saving home improvements for the South. Because you know it's not the same as what you might see on the internet, but applies to the rest of the country, and I think you know why. Um, our climate is just a little bit different. We're dealing with some different issues. I mean, you're aware, um, you know, that we're a cooling dominated climate. You know, the biggest part of your annual utility bill is air conditioning. You know, and this is an illustration. You see about 40% of your annual bill is heating and cooling. And for us, it's mostly cooling, right? Especially for you in New Orleans. And then another 20% water heating, 20% appliances, and another 20% other stuff, you know, like, like lighting and, and, um, and your electronics and so forth. So all of this kind of helps to, to frame what the priorities are for energy and money saving home improvements that also help you be comfortable in your home without having to sacrifice your comfort. And so I, I'm, it, it's, you know, it varies from house to house and depending on your lifestyle and, and what your home is like, but as a general rule in our climate, 
you know, these are the, the energy saving home improvement that will be, you know, give you bang for the buck, kind of in a priority order. And, and I, what I want you to notice, I'm going to go um, touch on each one of those today. But the ones that are in blue are really the primary benefit of those is cooling. It gives you more benefit for cooling, even though there's some for heating. The ones in red are more about heating, and so it's more of a wintertime benefit, which we do have a little bit of winter. And then the ones that are green are really not really um, seasonal. They, they benefit both, both cooling and heating season. So let's start with number one, and that's HVAC, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and especially air conditioning. And so um, these are the biggies, and, and what I want you know, you just see in that picture and, and the words behind it is forced air means if you have either a central air conditioning system or even window units or through the wall units, it is pulling in and pushing out air. It is forced air. So forced air means air movement, which means leaks also. And so that is a key thing to be aware of. But before we get into that, Let's talk the, the cheapest and the most, one of the most important things for you to do is to make sure that the equipment you have now is operating at, it mo at its greatest efficiency. And that means you gotta change those darn filters you know, on the schedule that the package says. Um, dirty filters, people don't realize it's not just a matter of dirt on the filter. It reduces the efficiency of your equipment. It makes your energy bills higher and by five to 15%. And what we recommend for air quality as well as to protect your equipment is to buy pleated filters that um, for air quality, we recommend a MERV 11. MERV is an efficiency rating of filters um, and how effective they are at removing fine dust particles. But if you're concerned about COVID or other infectious diseases, then you might move up to a 13 if your equipment can handle the resistance. So the thicker filters will create a less of a problem, but they're sometimes hard to retrofit. Either way, it is also very, very helpful, even though we tend to put it off, to have your equipment professionally serviced, checked, and cleaned yearly or at least every other year, depending on how much you use it. You know, there was a study in Florida a little while back that found that 75% um, of people's systems were undercharged, had not enough refrigerant, and that led to about a 20% decrease in efficiency. That's huge. That's like 20% of your bill is just thrown out the window. And, and in addition to that, the coils, the blower, all of that tend to get dirty, and when dirt builds up, that erodes the efficiency as well. So that, that, and you can't clean those yourself. You need a pro to do that. So that's important. And then another little tidbit, which is not so much about efficiency, but you know, when, when you got dirty stuff, then you know, what drips, the, con the condescent that drips may clog and you could get a leak. And so it's important to keep those drain lines clear and the professional can do that too. But some people think they can do it with bleach. Never, ever use bleach to clear those drain lines. There are special tablets to use instead. Never even use bleach near your air conditioning system. The, even the fumes from it are corrosive and they can do damage to your system. Now, we talked about forced air and what that means. You know, many of us in the South who have central air systems have ductwork in the air handler, either in the attic, and I know in your homes in New Orleans, a lot of you have it in the crawl space underneath as well. Both of those places, a vented attic or a vented crawl space, are really the great outdoors with just a little bit of structure around them. They're open to the outdoors. So if the ductwork is not super tight and air sealed, if it leaks, which is typical, typical existing ductwork that's not very new, tends to leak, studies have shown about 30% or more, even up to 50%. So that means 30 to 50% of all the air conditioning you're paying for is to air condition your attic and your crawl space where you don't live. That's a total waste and it can create air quality problems. But look at this illustration to see something else. When those ducts in the attic leak, what the air handler is doing is it's pulling air out of your home 
And then if some of it leaks to the outdoors, to the attic, it's putting back less than it took out. So what does that do? Create suction, like, like sucking through a straw. So that puts your whole house in a negative pressure, making it draw in outdoor air, which is hot and humid. You think that helps? Neither comfort nor energy. But in addition, if it touches, if it comes through that wall, it's being sucked through and it hits a cool surface, you could get condensation. And this is, you know, what happens behind vinyl wallpaper. If you ever have any negative pressure in a hot, humid climate, you get the mold and it's a very unhealthy kind of mold. So higher energy bills, less comfort, less poor indoor air quality, and also you're pulling in dust too. So, you know, bad, bad all the way around. Now, duct work is notoriously poorly attached and poorly installed. And sometimes, you know, it just comes loose over time as well. And so here you see an example of where the duct is, is attached, um, you know, to the boot, it, it's crimped and it's not well sealed. And so it, it's leaking air and you see all that mold of that dirty stuff where air leaks, the air is cold from air conditioning and it causes condensation and that grows mold. And so this is also a poor duct design, the way this is handled. But we've been talking about the supply ducts, the ducts that supply air to your living space from the air handler to your living space. There's another pathway and it's called the return, the return pathway. It's usually a plenum in a lot of our homes, which means it's just a cavity in the building. It should be ducted, but it's not. And so if, if that's the air, that's the, the pathway from the filter, you know, where you change the filter grill to the air handler unit that, that has the fan that's pulling it. And if that pathway is not sealed airtight, guess what's happening? You know, air is stupid. It doesn't know we want it to go through the filter first and get cleaned. So the air will bypass that filter. So you're actually pulling in air from likely the attic or the crawl space, going straight into that return pathway. And then it's dirty. It hasn't been filtered. It's hot, it's humid, it's dirty. And then it's going to get the coils dirty. They, they are wet, the evaporator coils. So then they will grow gunk and mold. And then that'll break off and get into the duct. So when you have dirty ductwork, dirty moldy ductwork, dirty wet coils, yes, you may need duct cleaning service or replacement if you can't really get them clean well enough. Um, but that's not the full fix. That's just the start. If you have dirty ducts, it means you have leaky return pathway or plenum. And, and so that needs to be remedied before you do anything else. So here is, you know, an air handler in the attic. And, and this is a smoke gun showing you that it's just sucking it in. So it's, it's not just the plenum, but it's also leaks around that air handler. So basically return leaks are bad. Keep that in mind. Very unhealthy and, and gets everything dirty. Now, what about ventilation? You know, we talk about HVAC includes ventilation and most of our homes, especially the older ones have ventilation just by being leaky. You know, they're just older leaky homes and even some of the newer homes are, are leaky, but we tend to not use mechanical ventilation, but natural ventilation is really just doesn't happen much in our homes. The air tends to be pretty stagnant most of the time because we don't have stack effect and we have very little wind outside of hurricanes but the natural ventilation that we get is really not natural at all. It's the ventilation caused by the air handler, by the, the pressure differences that it causes. So here you see, if you've got leaks in both the return and the supply ducts, that can increase your air leakage rate up to 300%. That's huge. But it also does something else. Think about, you know, What's happening here and, and when you close bedroom doors, then you're taking air out of the common area where the return is 
and you're putting air into the bedrooms, but it can't get back to the return. So you're pressurizing those bedrooms with closed doors and you're super depressurizing the rest of the house, causing it to suck and blow real hard in, from different areas, huge waste um, of energy and comfort. So what's the solution to that? The solution is to hire a certified trained professional to do a duct leakage test. Yeah, that'll cost a little bit money, but it is worth the investment because you can't just have your air conditioning guy go up there and look around at your duct and say, oh yeah, it looks okay. You know, if they say that, get somebody else um, because you cannot tell it, tell how leaky it is without measuring it. And it takes equipment like this. That's the only way to know. And so the recommendation is get it measured, see how leaky it is. If you have duct work, then use the equipment to identify the leakage points, get them sealed, then test it again to make sure that it really is tight this time. It will be worth the investment, both in health and in energy savings. Um, so sealing the ductwork, many of us have, um, the, some of the older homes may have rigid ducts, but many of us have flex ducts too, and it's notoriously poorly installed. We highly recommend that if there's flex duct, it should be straight, as few curves, never any 90 degrees or S curves or dips. It should be stretched straight, connected and hung properly and sealed with mastic. But some other things you can do, look at that top left picture um, there where you see that is the hole that the grill for the supply register, you know, in the room that's putting the cool air in your room. Oftentimes it's leaky around that boot. You can just take off the grill and caulk it. And if you have grills like air conditioning, supply grills that are sweating and getting moldy, that's what's happening. You're getting high humid air from the attic leak through there and you can seal that. But talk about sealing all the leaks in your ductwork and your return. And this is not the way to do it. Duct tape has a thousand wonderful uses, but not on your ducts. Okay, you can use it for everything else in your home, but not there because it does not stay. It does not endure. It comes loose over time because it doesn't handle the expansion contraction of hot and cold um, uh, expansion contraction of the ductwork. There are just two ways to do it. One is to get UL 181A rated um, mastic tape, and but they're not all created equal either. The thicker, more expensive tapes perform better than the thinner, cheaper tapes, and you have to roll them on and apply it just right. So really the best, most enduring fix for duct leaks that will last is that mastic that you that that you see in the picture on the top right that you paint on because it stays flexible and it maintains that seal over time. Pay a little extra and have them seal with real goopy mastic. That's what's going to endure over time. Now, when it comes time to replace your your air conditioner, your heating system. Um, it is, again, a good investment. This is a big expense, but it, when you have to replace it, shop for Energy Star qualified units. Look for that and ask for that Energy Star label um, and, and compare the ratings. Uh, air conditioners have SEER ratings. The higher the number, the more energy efficient, but surprise, you may be surprised. I don't recommend the highest SEERs because oftentimes they achieve that high SEER rating by sacrificing their dehumidification capacity. Okay in Arizona, not okay here, right? So go with like a SEER 15 or 16 is what I would recommend, you know, that's energy star, but not too overboard because you wanna be sure that it's going to dehumidify. The other big mistake people make is they decide bigger, they think bigger is better. And it's just the opposite. You do not want your air conditioning system to be oversized of the cooling load of the house. It's best to have a calculation, but on existing homes, they rarely do that. So don't upsize. And if you weatherize your home and make it a whole lot more energy efficient, you probably should downsize it a little bit. And here's why. When you buy an oversized air conditioner, you're paying more up front because it costs more, you know, for every time you add, 
it costs more to operate because it won't operate efficiently. So your bills will be higher. You'll have less comfort most of the year, especially in spring and fall, because it's going to short cycle when it's oversized and it won't dehumidify. So you'll be clammy and you'll be turning your thermostat down cooler and be cold just to get dehumidification. And then it won't last as long. So you lose four ways. Bigger is not better. You'll have to fight your contractor about this, perhaps, but be prepared to do that and stand your ground. It's better to be a little bit not quite as cool as you'd like on that big party you have on the 4th of July and then to be comfortable the rest of the year, right? I mean, that's what I would rather. And of course, set back thermostats. You know, if, if you're replacing a thermostat, get a programmable one that is easy to program. It's amazing how many people get programmable thermostats and never program because there's just too much to read in the manual. But now they have NIST, they have other types that are much easier and, um, and so that is the way to go. And what you do is you program them so that they don't fully cool or heat when no one's home. But you can do that manually. Whenever you leave the house, just set it to not cool completely to your comfort level. And then when you get back, just put it back where you want it. And so there's no point in conditioning an empty space for full comfort when nobody's there. Okay, that was number one, HVAC, that was a biggie. Number two is another real biggie for us, and that is sun control. To improve, do something to keep the solar heat and reflected heat, another radiant heat, off of the glass so it never even enters the home. You know we get radiant heat from the sun, but also it hits the pavement, heats up the pavement, and the pavement radiates heat back up, even when you have an overhang. So exterior sun control strategies are always superior to interior. Yeah, blinds and reflective, you know, uh, shades help a little bit, but not nearly as much as something on the exterior that is stopping that radiant heat before it enters your home. So solar screens, like you see on the left, are an easy do-it-yourself project. It also doubles as your insect screen. It blocks about 70% of the solar heat, yet you still have a view, and you, you can still have a breeze, too, when you open the windows. So, and you can take them off in winter to let the sun come in. So they are so cost-effective that you probably will um, pay for them in one or two summers at the most. So that's especially if you do it yourself. Then of course, anything, overhangs, uh, Bahama shutters like you see here, awnings, those cost more, but they're, they're great alternatives to shade glass, especially on the east-west side. Overhangs are great on the south side. And of course, landscaping. We love and value our, our beautiful mature landscaping. And that is more effective than anything at sun control because it shades not only the glass, but also the roof and the walls as well. There is another option. And I know many of you have single pane windows, the older windows. And, um, and that is a prime opportunity to use solar films on them. The solar film is applied to the interior side of the glass and, and depending upon their heat control film and depending on the one you choose, it could block anywhere from 60 to 80% of that radiant heat gain. That's huge. That can drastically help your cooling bill and make you way more comfortable. And it reduces fading of the fabrics of your upholstery. It increases your comfort, does all of that. Um, it doesn't have to be dark tinted. We talk about window tint in our cars. The, the technology is amazing. You can get clear, almost completely clear, not mirror effect either, low E films that still let daylight in. Those two um, acronyms at the bottom are what to look for in the fine print. The solar heat gain coefficient, SHGC, the lower the number, the smaller the number, the better, because that tells you how much heat it lets in and we want less heat. The BL is visible light. That tells you how much daylight it's a different wavelength that comes in. You want the higher, the better. So nowadays, you can get low E films that have a very low SHGC and a higher visible light transmittance. That is awesome. The technologies are great. 
So films, you can get them and do it yourself. You might lose your religion trying to make it to where, you know, you apply it without any air bubbles. It takes some finesse, but it's doable. I've done it before. And so you can do it if you want to save money, but getting a pro to do it is, is great too. Now, if you um, want to add storm windows because your old windows are very leaky, um, then they do make energy star storm windows that do have low solar heat gain coefficients and these low E coatings on them, plus they will reduce the air leakage. So that is an option. Or if you want to replace windows, I know in historic homes, you try to not do that. And that's why solar film is often the, the best option and then caulking and sealing and weather stripping. But, um, but if you need to replace windows, you can find Energy Star windows that are all wood. So they'll go with the historic um, nature and, and, and aesthetics that you're looking for. They don't have to be vinyl. They don't have to be metal, but they would still have these great numbers. And notice climate, you want Southern climate windows, not the, the yellow and blue areas of the country. So be sure to look for that. Number three priority is to seal air leaks. It is, has the biggest benefit in cold weather because it's you know bigger temperature difference and you don't like those cold drafts, but it, it's helpful in summer too. Um, it's just not as, you know, it, it just more winter benefit. And you can see from this little picture here, the main sources of air leakage are not where most people expect. Most people think it's going to be the under doors, you know, doors and windows. Those are significant, but the biggie is floors, walls, and ceilings, especially ceilings. Penetrations through the ceiling into the attic and then where the wall meets the floor. Um, in conventional frame, that would be the bottom plate in your balloon frame homes, then it's just wide open leaky. <laughs> so so that, is, that is a major leak point. And then second is the ducts, which we already talked about because it's forced air leakage. So that's huge. And third, believe it or not, is the fireplace. The reason a fireplace works is something called the chimney effect. The whole idea of having a chimney, it draws air up and out the chimney. So if that's not well sealed, that's a huge leakage point. So your top priority in trying to reduce the, the air leakage in and out of your home, which is really lost, it's like opening a window and leaving it open all the time, you know, is, is to look for these bypasses around things, you know, where, especially at the ceiling at high and low, where can air leak in and out, you know, and this illustration is just some examples. So first look for the big holes, big square holes that they put round stuff in, you know, like your flues and chimneys. So if you find this, then that needs to be remedied. But if it's a chimney, a fireplace chimney or, or a stove chimney, you need to use metal collars and high temperature caulk and then put, you know, this insulation down so then you can bring up insulation to it without creating a fire hazard. Other common areas is, is that space um, at the perimeter, you know, at, at, at your exterior wall between levels or where you have a knee wall in the attic or where you have two levels. And oftentimes that's just wide open to the outdoors. So a do-it-yourself is just put insulation in, a, in plastic bags and just stuff it. Just seal those great big gaps between the joists, the ceiling or the floor joists. Um, another big hole that's pretty common is if you have dropped soffits like over kitchen cabinets in the kitchen or, or other areas, you may have insulation stretched across it, but insulation is not an air seal. So it, it allows a lot of leakage and, and potential, you know, condensation and mold issues. So using more rigid materials to kind of seal that off under the insulation so that that's not an air leakage gap. Another real biggie is the attic access, the pull down stair or, or the, the scuttle hole that you might have. You know, if there's just a one inch, a one quarter inch gap all around that pull down stair, that leaks more air than your bathroom exhaust fan running constantly. Um, and if it's uninsulated on top of it, 
which it often is, that's like taking all the insulation you have over the rest of the attic and reducing it almost 30%. It's a huge loss because the attic gets really, really hot in the summer. So there's a huge temperature difference. So it is very, very helpful to seal that attic access um, door or, or pull down stair with, with weather stripping or gaskets and to find some way to insulate over it. You can create a box with rigid foam or you can buy kits with thick uh, fiberglass insulation that, that kind of stay on it. You can buy something called an attic tent that helps to seal and then you can add insulation to that. So there are a number of things on the market. Another big energy <clears throat> loser, because it's you know between the conditioned space and the attic, are recessed can lights. I know a lot of the older homes don't have them, but you know if you hired an interior designer to remodel, you probably got some recessed can lights installed. And they can. Um, this is what they often look like. They're not supposed to have insulation come in contact with the with the, the regular type, and they're often very very air leaky. So they're so leaky that I call them turbocharged leakage because they're like having a two square foot hole between your cool space and the hottest place on the planet, the attic. In addition, when you turn on the lights, that heats up the air and it causes a draft. So it really speeds up the air leakage. So it's just, you know, typical types of recessed cans are just a real turbo turbocharged um, leakage and, and, and energy loss. So, but you can buy, you can order from Amazon or the home stores, um, these pre-made covers and you just put them on and you seal it and they, they have to keep a clearance of four inches around it for fire safety. Then you can insulate around those and they provide the air seal or just replace them. Or if you're doing new stuff, install the ones that are ICAT rated, that's insulation contact and airtight. So if they're not ICAT rated, you need those covers um, sealed to the attic floor and then you can insulate around it. Um, if you have uh, a water heater or your um, air conditioner or your furnace or anything in a closet, Oftentimes they are not properly sealed and you could have major air leakage between it and the attic or the crawl space. And of course that needs to be sealed along with any other penetration of the subfloor and the attic for wiring, plumbing, anything else. You use spray foam to seal that, but you need to find them first. So you find and seal those penetrations. If it's a small gap, you can use caulk. If it's bigger gaps, you need to use a spray foam. It doesn't have to be a professional. You can buy the cans at, you know, the home stores, Lowe's and, and, and Home Depot or any, or any hardware store and, and do that yourself. Push aside the insulation, seal those gaps, and then re-insulate. Um, this shows some examples of an infrared camera on a cold day showing major, major temperature differences where there are leaks on a cold day through the wall, you know, whether it's a, it's a fan or where the wall meets the ceiling or it's common areas. So try anything that you can do to seal those would be helpful. An easy, really, really cheap thing to do is to buy outlet and switch gaskets. They go behind the faceplate. You just unscrew the faceplate, you stick them on and you put the faceplate back. You know, a 10 year old could do it. And they, you get a whole pack of them for less than two bucks. So it, it really can reduce quite a bit of air leakage that comes through walls, even interior walls. And then again, I mentioned again, sealing or any gaps in the framing around windows and doors, if you can remove a little trim and, and foam seal, but don't use a fast expanding foam, use the expanding foam for windows and doors. Otherwise you'll have trouble opening them afterwards. And then that wall to floor joint, if you can remove the quarter round, maybe the baseboard and try and foam or caulk seal that gap um, in a way that it's not gonna squish out, you know, as you put things back, you know, that is probably the most practical way to seal a major, major air leak point. 
windows and doors, you know, as you know, they tend to leak um, and it's more evident, you know, when it's cold outside. And of course, you know, the solution there is weather stripping and there are many products to fit many types of units and, and sizes of gaps. What's really important is to make sure that that they're properly installed and that they compress when you shut the window door so that they really are making a good seal. And this again can be a nice do-it-yourself and you know a really doable do-it-yourself project. What about that fireplace chimney? You know, the dampers that they install are notoriously leaky. And so you're constantly sending air up that chimney. There's something called fireplace balloons that you can order, you know, for, uh, online and, and you just prop them up and you blow them up and you prop them up and it seals that where the damper is. Just remember to take them out before you start a fire, of course. And so, but this can be done the rest of the year when you're not using the fire. Okay, we've done one, two, and three priorities. The fourth one is actually lighting. Uh, changing out your light bulbs. If you still have any incandescent light bulbs, hopefully you had switched most of them to CFL compact fluorescence, but now the LEDs have, have come down so much in price and, and the quality and the variety of them has improved so much. It really makes good sense to evolve again to the LEDs on the right. Um, and that's because both the CFLs and LEDs, but especially the LEDs, they use up to 90% less electricity, you know, to produce the light. So that saves some energy. But the big deal is not that. The big deal for us is they create, they give off 70 to 90% less heat. That's the bigger deal for us. They produce so much less heat. So that's less heat your air conditioner has to remove. So not only do you directly save electricity, you reduce your air conditioning load by switching to these cooler lights. And they last so much longer that you really do come out ahead in the long run, even though they cost more up front. Now there's so many shapes and different types of sockets. You can replace almost any light bulb, both um, fluorescent and incandescent with an LED. When you shop, shop lumen. Lumen are the measure of light output, not watts. We're used to saying, oh, a 60 watt bulb, 100 watt bulb to reflect how much light we want. But with the newer bulbs, a 60 watt bulb really in an LED will only use 13 to 15 watts. That's why it's so much cooler, but the same lumen, the same in light output. So look for the lumen, they have to put it now on the packaging. And then you also want to um, know something about the color and the appearance for our homes, for a lot of rooms, especially the bedrooms, you know, we like the soft white or the warm white, which are the, the, the cooler color, I mean, the warmer color temperatures are the smaller numbers, the K, the Kelvin scale. And then the bigger numbers, get wider and wider until you get to daylight. Now, the thing about daylight, people think they don't want it, it's going to be harsh, but that is the best light for reading. That is the kind of, of lamp you want to put in your reading lamp, especially if your eyes are aging, kind of like mine. The older you get, you know, not like Anna, she's young, she can see anywhere. But, but I need that, if, you know, if I take something, I cannot read it indoors with warm light, but if I go outside in the daylight, I can read it just fine without my reading glasses. It makes a huge difference. And one little line up when it comes to saving energy with lighting is choose light colors whenever you paint or decorate. And, and, and that is a, you know, kind of a free way if you're going to paint anyway, to reduce the amount of artificial light that you need um, inside your home and to reflect the heat uh, from your siding. Number five, improve water heating efficiency. We saw in the beginning that, that water heating is usually about 20% of your total energy bill. And then this, uh, this little pie chart shows where the biggies are with that. So of course, showering and bathing is the biggest. Clothes washing is next. The others are significant too, but those are the two ones to pay most attention to. But there are things we can do to improve our existing water heater as it is. 
first of all, a free and easy thing to do is to just find the temperature setting on it and lower it to 120 degrees. That can save four to 20% and it prevents scalding. You know, it is a safety factor too. Now, if you have an old dishwasher, all the modern ones now have a, have a heating function. So you can set it at what set your, your water heater at 120 and it will heat it up to the 140 that it needs to do a good job with your dishes. But if you have an old one that doesn't do that, then you might want to set it a little higher, like 130. You're, I'm talking about your water heater. The other thing is buy a kit to insulate the tank if that hasn't already been done. If you have gas, follow the safety you know, instructions very, very carefully. You don't want to create a fire hazard. You, know, you want to keep it off where the top. But, um, but that can save 7 to 16% of your water heating bill. If you have electric and you have a way to lift it where you can put rigid foam board underneath, that is a better insulation job. And then, of course, the hot water pipes. You know, if you insulate those with those tubes that you just stick on, it's very, very easy. Do it yourself. That can save another three to four percent. But something a lot of people aren't aware of is you see in this picture, the, the water pipes coming in and out and have like a little gooseneck. That's a heat trap. So if you see that you don't have a gooseneck or a loop or some kind of nipple device or a valve device, then it is exchanging hot and cold water all the time which is a huge loss. So be sure you have some kind of heat trap in the piping. When you need to replace, water heaters don't last forever, and when you do need to replace one, consider upgrading to a more efficient one. Um, the ratings now are called UER, Uniform in, uh, Energy uh, Rating or Factor. And, and so look at those numbers and get the highest number you can afford. If you have gas, which I know many of you do, there are Energy Star rated high efficiency gas tank water heaters. Um, those will really uh, cut your water heating bill. Or you could go with a gas tankless water heater if you want to change to a type. Um, you know, costs a little more, but there's no standby loss in the because there's no tank. It heats water as you use it. And the, the big plus of that is not so much huge energy savings, but the big plus is you never run out of hot water. So if you have teenagers, you know, that's a big plus. Um, I had four of them. And so I wish I'd had one of those, but anyway. The other option that has, has finally come around, um, the technology is, is here and ready for the masses, is the heat pump water heater. So if you have an electric water heater, you might want to consider instead of just getting an electric one, which are, there are no energy star rated electric ones unless they are a heat pump water heater. So yes, they do cost more, but they, the, heat, the water heating bill will be a lot less. And they also provide a little cooling, like about a half ton air conditioning and, and a little dehumidification. So if, if they're inside the home, um, that can be a benefit for most of the year. And of course, you know, choosing things that will allow you to live your same comfort and lifestyle and cleanliness with less hot water. So Energy Star rated dishwashers and clothes washers use a lot less hot water than the older ones. Um, they do make special low flow shower heads that instead of being, you know, something you hate, they have big, large droplets. And if they create large droplets, they not only feel good, but they retain the heat. So you use less hot water in your mix. And so look for the low flows if you get one that has large droplets. And then of course, you know, some of our habits are really wasteful of hot water. You don't ever need to use hot water to rinse, to do always use a cold water rinse for clothes and for dishes. Um, you can use cold water for most laundry if you use good detergent or a little bit more. And then waiting for full loads are just, you know, habits that can cut that bill. We've been through the top five. Once you do the top five, you might want to consider going to number six, which is improving attic insulation. That's really a bigger help in winter, but it does help some in summer too. So I went ahead and made it green because many times you go up in the attic and this is what the insulation looks like. It's compacted. Every place it's compacted or squished, it loses our value. Or it's missing, or it's super thin. 
these are places where, yeah, it would definitely be worthwhile to beef it up. You don't have to remove what's there, just top it off either with a, a spray, a loose film like cellulose, um, if your ceiling is well sealed, or you can go over with another layer of bats across the joist, you know, between something between the joist and these across, so you get full coverage. We recommend beefing it up to what, what's considered an R38. So, you so if you have six inches or less of insulation, it's worthwhile to add more to reach a total of R38. Um, or more if you want to, but that's, that's kind of the sweet spot of cost and benefit. Of course, in doing so, adding that insulation might make it to where it comes up and reaches the, the underside of the roof and blocks the ventilation from your overhang soffits to, to your uh, ridge vents, and that's not good. And so you may need to um, put in baffles or something to maintain that airflow pathway of your attic ventilation. And that attic ventilation is, is it's really in the code for winter. It prevents moisture problems in winter. Um, but we get some benefit from it in summer, but it's not a big energy benefit. The bigger energy benefit, if you want a cooler attic and to keep your ductwork in the attic from heating up so much is a radiant barrier. So a radiant barrier is like a foil, like a reinforced foil material and it's an easy do-it-yourself if, you, if your attic is accessible to staple it to the underside of the rafters, shiny side down, because if it collects dust on the shiny side, it won't work. This is a different kind of physics principle where it, it's not reflecting heat, it's, it's low E, it's low emission. So it blocks the radiant heat from emitting through it. And any place, you know, radiant heat is like where the sun heats up the roof and the roof gets really hot and then it radiates. And that radiant heat heats up your ductwork. It heats up your attic floor insulation. So this stops like 90 something percent of the radiant heat, which will also keep your attic cooler. Um, and, and so it can just be stapled to the rafters. So it, it, it's something that can, be, um, that can be retrofitted quite easily. And you don't have to have full coverage. Any place you have it will provide um, It'll, it'll stop the, radi the radiation at that point, or most of it. Okay, getting down to number seven, and that is to optimize the efficiency of your appliances. And if you're buying any appliances or electronics, TVs, computers, any of that, um, buy Energy Star because there are two costs to it. One is the purchase price, and then there's the cost you pay every month in your energy bill to use it. So don't forget that operating cost is often in the long run higher than the purchase price. Um, so of the ones that you already have in place, especially if you have an older refrigerator, try the, the little dollar bill test. Stick it in there, close the door and see if you can easily pull it out. If it slips out easily, you don't have a good seal and, and that needs to be remedied. Be sure you vacuum the coils, which might be underneath or in the back of the refrigerator because if they get dirty, it loses efficiency. And if you have a freezer, keep it full. A full freezer will run more efficiently than one that's partly empty. So if you don't, if you don't, you know, can't fill it with food right now, just get jugs of water and fill it with that. Plus, if you lose power in the next storm, you'll be glad that they were there to help keep your, your food um, viable a little bit longer. In terms of the clothes dryer, be sure and clean that, clean that lint filter before every load and also get those exhaust ducts cleared and cleaned at least a couple of times a year. And you might wanna clean the moisture sensor. All of this preserves the efficiency of that appliance. But another biggie is the kind of ducts that tend to be used to duct the exhaust from the dryer. We highly recommend metal ducts um, the smooth are even better than the flex, but they're safer and they won't sag. When they sag, they really trap the lint and that creates not only an obstruction that reduces efficiency, but a fire hazard. And there, there are fires resulting from this. So those plastic and those corrugated um, foil ducts, replace those. We really don't recommend those. They tend to kink and sag. 
Now, there's something called vampire loads. You may or may not be aware that, mo that your TVs, your computers, and, and many of your smart type electronics and appliances these days, when you turn them off, they're not really off. They're just partly off. They're still using power. So they use power the whole time they're off to be ready for instant on. And that is a vampire load. That's like, you know, it's there, but you can't see it. It's in the dark. And so, so there are smart power strips that you can plug all of these kind of vampire load appliances and, and electronics and equipment in, and it will sense that it's really turned off and it'll cut off the power to it entirely, but come back on automatically when you turn it on. That, that helps save a little bit of energy too. And of course, whenever you're buying appliances or electronics, again, look for that blue Energy Star label. You will save in the long run um, in your monthly utility bill. And they generally have quality assurances as well. So, so look for that label. And you can also look at the Energy Guide label if it has one, that yellow label, because it'll compare models and actually how much money it'll cost you to operate it comparing one model to the next. So that's very interesting. Number eight, which is really important in our cooling dominated climate is moisture control. And why is that? It's not just to prevent moisture problems. It's also because your air conditioner actually is there to do two things. Your air conditioner removes heat it takes the air in your home, it removes heat, and then puts that air back with less heat, but it also removes moisture. So a part of your cooling bill is to remove moisture. So that means you wanna try and minimize the moisture it has to remove. Of course, we're not gonna stop breathing, we're not gonna stop bathing, we're not going to stop cooking, but we can have exhaust fans in the bathrooms and over the stove. And the thing is, however, so many times they're there, but they are not installed right and they don't work. So here you see the exhaust fans, not even ducted to the soffit. So it's dumping all that humidity into the insulation attic. Bad, bad, bad idea. So you really wanna make sure the dampers are in place, the flaps turn out, and that the, the duct work is a nice, smooth run, large ducts like the manufacturer specifies to the nearest soffit and out through the soffit, not just into it, but through an outlet with no sags and absolutely the minimal number of bends, no S curves, no U-turns, which I often, often see. Now, if you have um, an exhaust fan that's very leaky, just like the recessed cam lights, you can box them, you can probably buy some, or you can make something. Just be sure to cut the hole for the ductwork and install the ductwork as well. If you don't have exhaust fans, or if you've got really lousy ones that need to be replaced, then again, Energy Star. Buy Energy Star exhaust fans and make sure the ductwork, I almost never see it properly installed. Make sure that they follow, put it in the spec, they follow the manufacturer recommendation. See this picture? It, this is going through the roof, it can go through the soffit, but smooth, gradual, and minimal turns. No 90 degrees, no S curves, no U turns. Every one of those reduces the airflow. So you're buying an 80 CFM fan and it might operate at 15 or 20 if the duct's not right. Again, the kitchen. What about we cook? Oh man, this is Louisiana. You know, you cook gumbo and you're going to make a lot of steam for a long time. And so the hood exhaust is important. Of course, the hood, you need a hood that is exhausted to the outdoors, not just to recirculating and not into the attic. You know, that could create a moisture problem. But you also want all your exhaust fans to be quiet. Look at the sewn ratings. The smaller the number, the better. Make sure it's quiet so you'll actually won't mind using it. And then for the kitchen, we do not recommend the 1,000 to 1,500 CFM emerald hoods, okay? Emerald needs that in his kitchen, of course. It's a commercial kitchen. You don't want that in your house. 
I, it, it may be status symbol, it may be, you know, look really cool, but it's a bad idea. It's going to cause a huge negative pressure. And so we say get a hood that's just 100 to 400 CFM. That's enough if the hood is big enough. What's more important than the CFM number is the size and the shape of the hood. It should extend over the front burners. If it does that, it's just the physics of steam rises is going to capture it. So it'll have much better capture efficiency. And it's better to be against the wall and to have something that comes down the sides or have a curve. You want capture efficiency, not high CFM. Now, if you've done all these eight and you still got some money to spend on energy improvements, you're not exhausted yet, you might consider insulating floors or walls if you've done everything else first, okay? Because this is not going to be your best bang for the buck. So optimize the others first. However, if your floors and, and like some of these old, you know, historic um, New Orleans homes just have, have hardwood planks right on the joist with no subflooring at all and it's super, super leaky. Yeah, that can be pretty uncomfortable. So that may bump it up in the priority list because you just can't stand it in the wintertime. But realize it's mostly a wintertime issue. Um, if you have that or you have an issue where you've got cupped wood flooring and you've got decay um, of your subfloor or your floor door, something like that, that's more of a high priority issue too. Then you may need to act. And I'm going to talk about two solutions to that. Um, as for walls, if you have empty walls in these older homes, you know, one option that's done in the rest of the country is to dense pack cellulose. They know a little hole through the siding, they dense pack it in with a tube and they seal up the hole. Yeah, it works fine in most of the country because they're cold dominated and it dries out if it gets wet. We dry in because we air condition and that creates a vapor drive inward. And we're super, super rainy. We're almost a tropical rainforest in our level of rain. So I caution, if you want to consider a dense pack, only do it if you have big overhangs all around or you have some kind of sufficient weather barrier behind the siding, um, house wrap or you know, with sheathing or something like that. And of course, no vinyl wallpaper, which I would never recommend in our climate anyway, and not even oil-based interior paint that reduces the ability, the permeability of the wall. Use only latex paint. Um, real uh, plaster is good. Plaster is great. You know, drywall is good. Both are permeable with latex paint. That's the key. After Hurricane Katrina, when we had new building codes and energy codes for the first time, we were going to have more raised homes, and the codes were fine. Maybe insulated under it. I went, oh no. This is going to be a disaster, and it has been. The number one inquiry I get is cupped wood floors and, and subfloor moisture problems outside of hurricanes or storms or floods. And so um, this is a report that's available on our website. It's written consumer-friendly language on the study that we did, and we did it in actually Habitat for Humanity in some Musicians Village houses in New Orleans. And, um, and we, we tested various subfloor insulation systems and how that affected the moisture of the, of the wood of the subfloor. Here's the issue. In a hot, humid climate, da -da, us, raised floors rot and cup in the summer. They rot and cup in the summer because we air condition. When those homes, when your homes were built, there was no air conditioning. Everything was fine. They didn't have, you didn't have this problem. The problem occurs because of air conditioning. We create a cool, dry interior and that creates a vapor drive and it also causes condensation when the subfloor gets cold. So you combine cool air conditioning and the cooler you set your thermostat, the worse the problem. You add impermeable floor finish like polyurethane, solvent-based polyurethane on the wood or vinyl or laminate flooring. And then you make it even worse with insulation that allows air and moisture to get to the subfloor. And that is an actual formula, like a, a, a prescription, a formula for having wet subfloors, cupped wood flooring, mold and decay fungi, and all that attracts termites. So one of the solutions 
is basically there are two subfloor insulation systems that prevented the moisture problem. And they both are airtight vapor barrier insulation systems. One of them is to use rigid um, foam board under the joist, taped and sealed, all airtight uh, system. It's kind of hard to do, but if, if it's high enough off the ground, it works beautifully. Of course, you need a termite shield below it. It puts your entire subfloor kind of within your condition space. The other alternative is closed cell spray foam. And again, this creates an airtight uh, near vapor barrier insulation system, but it's more practical to install if you're kind of close to the ground. In doing so, the, the foam needs to, the thinnest part of it needs to be at least two inches to have that low permeability. And it also gives you the R value, you know, the, the code likes to see. Um, and, and, but, and if the space is kind of enclosed, we would recommend a light coating of the spray foam on the joists, but you don't need two inches. And because, you know, the joists are not fully protected, like with the rigid foam board, we do also recommend the inside, the, the grade under the house be higher than the outside if at all possible. And if it is, then put a plastic ground cover on it, you know, like this clean or something and, and stake it down to reduce the evaporation. That will reduce the moisture loading of that space, particularly if it's, if it's semi-enclosed. Those are the only two systems that really worked to both insulate and prevent subfloor moisture problems. If you can't afford to do either of these two systems, do not insulate your subfloor. If you have just planks on the joist, you cannot do the spray foam like this because then it'll seep through the cracks and that wouldn't be good. So then you're, you're limited to the other system unless you have some other way to, to deal with it. Um, unless you can get some kind of um, subfloor or at least building paper, something under that, under your wood flooring. Last, um, Lee, is that, you know, we talked about walls and, and dense pack, you know, the precautions there, but after Katrina, there was kind of a demo project where, um, you know, the home had flooded and it had been gutted. It was a historic New Orleans home. And, and this was a system to show how you can do a high energy efficiency wall insulation system um, in these historic homes. And so, you know, the, first of all, the home started with very wet clapboards and, and no bulk water air or vapor retarder, you know, just leaks like a sieve, which is okay when there's no insulation, but if you're adding insulation, you need a weather barrier. They, it's also balloon framing. And that, that was specifically done to help cool houses that had no air conditioning because they would take the cooler air down below the house and send it up the walls and keep them from getting so hot. But now when we air condition, you know, that's not a good thing. And so what they did here was they used a drainage mat up against the clapboard to allow for drainage and drying of water that comes through the siding. Then um, they filled that, that gap down at the floor level so it wasn't you know, an opening anymore, kind of created a seal between the studs. Then used rigid foam board cut to fit between the studs um, and that forms the weather barrier that stops the moisture from coming any further. Then you can use any kind of insulation you want to fill the rest of the space. With historic homes, generally, oftentimes, the historic societies don't want to see you use spray foam unless it's done in a way that it's reversible. Basically, whatever you do in a historic home needs to be reversible. So you could use bats, you could use uh, damp spray cellulose, or you could just use more rigid foam boards either way. So that is if, if you're taking off the, you know, the interior um, uh, finish, the interior plaster for whatever reason, this is an opportunity as well. Well, those are all of the, you know, the, the techniques and the home improvements that are really tailored for our climate that can help. But there, there is more information. I said, you know, information that you find off the internet is generally not appropriate. But an exception to that is energystar.gov. They do have this home energy yardstick and energy star advisor where you put in your zip code and some information about your house and it can give you some more guidance similar to what I have, but maybe with some more details of cost and benefit. 
and then a lot of other, you know, knowledge center where you can get some information, but it does have some climate specific. Another fabulous resource that's really designed for builders and designers and professionals, but it's user friendly enough, I think, for a homeowner and consumer is the Building America Solution Center. They have so much there that's guidance and details and illustrations and pictures and videos and, and CAD drawings, you know, and climate specific packages. It used to be strictly new construction information, but now they've gotten into existing homes and also added resilience to it as well. This is my website or our program's website um, at La House Resource Center. So you can either Google La House Resource Center or lsuaccenter.com forward slash La House. We also have Facebook if you want to follow us. And we have a whole lot of videos on YouTube. My La House is what you type in for that. Our website has a lot of information, both about the facility as well as just articles and publications. Here you can see on the right some of the primary publications that I mentioned. Improve Your Home and Prosper are, again, the most cost-effective energy improvements for existing homes, and there are many, many others as well. So when you go there, click on the My House, My Home, and you can see there, you can click Home Improvement. You can also find certified professionals who can do this ductly testing, and you can get publications and, and, and also get a link to the Ag Center's landscape information as well, which I know a lot of you may be interested in that. This is the actual resource center on the LSU campus. It's built like a house, only it's built with four different high-performance building systems. And it is open to the public for self-guided touring Monday through Friday, 10 to 4.30. You don't need an appointment. You can just come and explore to your heart's content. Um, we have point of feature signage and lots and lots of free materials um, on many topics. La House is a showcase of solutions for our climate and our natural hazards, which also gets into healthy home, indoor air quality, universal design for all ages and stages of life, as well as energy efficiency and resilience and many, many other things. We didn't do anything one way, we did everything like three to five ways. So you can see a range of good solutions at different cost levels. So I think I have used up my time and a little more and I want to invite questions and um, I'm ready. All right, we actually have a good amount of questions. So I'm glad, I think we're on good time right now. And I don't wanna take up too much of your evening. I know we gotta to get to dinner and everything. Um, oh, I'm so all yours as long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> careful, careful. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> um, so I've kind of categorized the questions that I've received and it looks like I'm going to go kind of in order. We have well, some floor questions, some roof questions, and some of the things I think you touched on. So it might just be going back and just refreshing. Um, okay. And so I think that the floor questions was really about um, insulating. So what type of insulation do you recommend beneath hardwood flooring that rests directly on the floor joists and what insulation is recommended for a raised shotgun house. You know, I think that people have the problem that termite companies may invalidate insurance if they use foam or and again, some of the other concerns with. Yeah, that, you know, that is an issue. And, and it's an issue that I have with the termite companies because they, they, are, they want to be able to inspect what they're used to getting to see. They don't expect to see inside your walls and so, you know, there are technologies, there are other ways to detect termites besides the old, you know, school way to detect. But I do highly um, recommend provide some inspection area between the ground and where you have this insulation. Spray foam really should not be a deterrent. If one company won't give you a contract, if you have spray foam, I would look for another company that would. Make sure you have termite shields if you have any way to add that. The shields don't stop termites, but they force them to reveal themselves. So the shields, of course, should be below that insulation point. If you have, um, if you have hardwood flooring right on the joist and you don't have a subflooring, like, like I think I, I mentioned briefly, um, you, you can't really just put spray foam on the underside of those floor joists. I, I mean, you can, but it'd be a bad idea. You don't want to do that. And so your options yeah. are one. <laughs> I was like, hold on, no, no. <laughs> your, op 
Sometimes I run using the rigid foam board under the joist if you're raised enough to do that. You need to be about three feet off the ground to make that doable. You know, I mean, I, you know, my standard joke is to do that, to do that system, you need pygmies with really good workmanship and they're hard to find. I mean, <laughs> I don't mean to be insensitive, but, uh, <laughs> but really you need people who can fit you know, <laughs> under the yeah. floor and, and install that and seal it airtight. So if you can do that system, that really is the best solution. Um, because then also, you know, you don't have to change anything about your flooring. If you cannot do that, I would not recommend the closed cell spray foam where you just, you know, right on the underside of the, of the floor joist. I would say, you know, your alternatives are one, remove the flooring and put some subflooring down, big expense, or just don't insulate. Just live with it. You know, yeah. Yeah. Someone did mention in the chat that, you know, and something that we deal with a lot with the historic buildings is the Secretary of Interior Standards has kind of switched its perspective on on what kind of insulation. Because I think we're just learning as we go is that that spray foam can really be damaging sometimes as it starts to trap moisture, and and that's in your attic, that could be in your walls, that, and so that is a fallacy. That you know that. People get afraid of, they say it traps moisture. There are two kinds of spray foam. There's open cell and closed cell. Right. Closed cell does have a low permeability, but that's why it works in a subfloor system because the vapor drive and the condensation issue is from outside to in. And so it stops that moisture. It does not let the moisture get to your subfloor and that's what you want. Yes, and so that provides the protection that you need. Whereas we tried in the study, the open cell, which is very permeable, you know, mm -hmm. moisture can go through it with a vapor barrier paint skin, it didn't cut it, it wasn't good enough. And right. so the subfloor is the one area where it, it, if you're going to use foam, it's got to be the closed cell because mm -hmm. you want it to stop that vapor drive and you want to prevent air and moisture from ever reaching the subfloor. So that is the issue to prevent subfloor moisture problems. And it's strictly because we air condition. So mm -hmm. if you can't do that, um, you know, what I would suggest if you're going with, a, if you have a subfloor and you're going with the closed cell spray foam, then um, it's best if the finish on your wood flooring is not the solvent type polyurethane, but the water-based. The water-based polyurethane you know, gives you that finish. It's a clear finish. It doesn't have that amber tone, which you may or may not like, but, um, but I did it on, on my old flooring and, and it's just gorgeous. And, and it has a little bit of permeability. So keep your flooring as permeable as possible to try and minimize the subfloor moisture problems. But, but um, foam, Spray foam, I mean, everything has pluses and minuses, but, but open cell does not trap moisture. Closed cell does have a low, but not, it's not completely impermeable, but it's low, but it's fine to use it in walls. It, it creates a flood hardy wall system with high R value and very airtight. It's fine to use it under the roof, but I would want a very robust roof underlayment, um, you know, with that. So I prefer open cell in an unvented attic under the roof. Um, and I prefer open cell in the walls. However, in historic homes, you know, it's reversibility is the issue. And so in, in that case, you know, um, because it, it may, um, you can do things like you can line it with, with house wrap and do the spray foam in that, you know, in your walls so that it's reversible, but that's an added hassle. So it's just more practical to use another type of insulation, um, you know, in, in your attic or in the walls if you get to do it. And, and frankly, I really like cellulose um, for those applications. If you do cellulose on the attic floor, you want to be sure that first you air seal the ceiling. You do not want that cellulose dust being pulled into your house. So if you don't air seal the ceiling, then stick with that. If you can air seal your ceiling, cellulose has some advantages, especially if the fire retardant or is boric acid is borates. Uh, bugs and mold doesn't like the borates. It, it tends to be a deterrent to it. And it's a recycled product. And it also has, it adds moisture buffer capacity 
to your ceiling or to your wall system. So in these old homes, you get more moisture intrusion and the water vapor form, it's okay if it doesn't condense and become liquid water. And so that the, the cellulose offers some added buffer capacity. There are a lot of good insulation products out there, but basically bats, the issue with bats um, is, is that the way they're typically installed. You know, the bat itself is a fine product if it's properly installed, I've just never seen it done. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not a, really a joke. I mean, you laugh, but it's not really a joke. And so because every place you compress it or you push into side staple reduces its R value and, and creates convective current. So the way it's typically installed, you know, but on, on, on an attic floor going across the joist, like you put some bats between the joists and then perpendicular some across, that's an awesome system. So you can certainly do that and that works well. Did I answer the question? Yes, I think you answered that question in a couple of the ones for the roof. <laughs> 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 so I, I think, um, and I know that you had talked about the radiant barrier um, for the roof. So moving on to like the roof um, insulation. So we have, should reflective thermofoil, which is used to reduce the radiant heat in a home, be installed on the roof rafters in the attic, on the ceiling joists in the attic, or both? just on the rafters. Um, and it's because of the dust issue. You know, if you, if you lay it across the floor of your attic, it'll work until it gets dusty. Then it'll become useless. Then it won't work at all. So there's no point in putting it there because it will collect dust. So that's why we say staple it to the underside of the rafters, shiny side down. The shiny side is what has that low emissivity property and what stops the radiant heat from emitting through it. And so it will stay clean and you must have airflow along it too. And so that's why it's most effective at, you know, the roof line. And so from, for a retrofit, just staple it to the underside of the rafters wherever you can reach to put it. And it doesn't need to be continuous. It doesn't need to be sealed. It's not, the, it's not insulation like other insulations that are there to stop conduction and convection this is strictly for radiant heat radiant heat is the heat you feel from the sun or a fire or a hot object it travels in a straight line through space regardless of the temperature of the objects or the, or the air and so that's the kind of heat that a radiant barrier will help with and it becomes cost effective one if you do it yourself and two if you have um, your air conditioner and ductwork in the attic. If you have no ductwork in the attic, then, you know, it'll still help. It'll keep your attic cooler, but it'll be a longer payback, you know, if that's what you're looking for. But if you're just like, you know, like it's better to just beef up your attic floor insulation to R38 if you can, you know, spend money on that because that helps you year round. The radiant barrier only helps you in summer. Yeah, and we actually had a question about the uh, an attic flooring situation. They had said that their attic has some batten insulation and then has plywood decking on top. Does the decking need to be removed in order to add more batten insulation or can the additional batten insulation be added on top what, of the plywood? What you don't want is a gap. So if, if the decking is in direct contact with the insulation below it and there are no gaps, you know, there's no compression, there's no voids and gaps below it, then you could just put more on top. Um, but what you don't want are, is, is, are gaps in your insulation that can carry air currents. And so that's the real deciding factor. So if decks, you know, oftentimes you really don't know what the insulation's like underneath that deck. You know, if you can see it and there are no gaps, go for it, just leave the deck in place. But if you can't tell, mm -hmm then it's probably best to remove the deck and just beef up your insulation and then create a new deck with, with legs, you know, like with sides to where they stand on the, the joists, you know, and are high enough above the thickness of insulation that you want. Um, and then this is something interesting too. Um, so for roofing in a historic district, are some of the cool roof there effective for energy bill savings versus the increased cost? 
or would the radiant heat bear you mentioned do the same task for less with a regular asphalt shingle roof? Okay, can you repeat that? You, you the the sound cut out a little bit, and I didn't catch. Sorry. So so they're asking about the cool roof materials that are now come, becoming a little bit more popular. So saying that are some of the cool roofs out there effective for energy bill savings versus oh, the like increased the cost? Oh, like the roofing itself, the cool Right, roofing. yeah, like the, the actual most energy, outcome with like a... Right, the most energy saving, you know, from a cooling standpoint for air conditioning, the most energy saving roof is white painted metal. Mm -hmm. And that will be most effective because it's both... It, it, you know, the irony is that it's reflective of the heat. Right. It stops the heat before it goes any further and it's reflective, but the paint, it's actually better than a galvalum or a tin, it's kind of silvery type roof because one is mm -hmm. they corrode over time and they lose their reflectivity. But also, you know, it, it seems counterintuitive, but the roofing, if you have a metal roof, you want it to be high emissivity. You want it solar reflective, but high emissivity, because the high emissivity will, will then help it to cool off at night when the sun's not out. And so over the course of 24 hours, you'll come out better with that. So a white painted roof, which nobody wants in Louisiana, <laughs> except in the rural areas from an aesthetic standpoint. However, there are cool color pigments now. So you can buy metal roofing that has a dark or mid-tone color with the solar reflectance of a light color. Again, they are Energy Star labeled. Mm -hmm. So if you want a, a, um, a cool roof, look for an Energy Star label on it and look at the numbers of solar reflectivity and you want high emissivity and high solar reflectivity. That will perform better than a radiant barrier if it's very solar reflective but if it's not, the radiant barrier, you know, is a great and a much less expensive solution. There are cool shingle now. Um, there are mm -hmm. some shingle products that have that same kind of cool pigment technology in them. But they, they tend, as far as, you know, last time I checked, they tend to cost double what similar shingles would be without that. And, and so the payback on that is very, very long. So if you have say a cathedral ceiling and that's the only thing you can do, you can't do a radiant barrier, you know, you might wanna consider that. But if you have an attic, um, it'd be more cost effective to add a radiant barrier than to go with the cool color shingles. The radiant right. barrier under, you know, under the roof deck. Yes. And so this, um, we have one person asking, I've heard that radiant barriers increase the temperature of the roof deck and will reduce the life of my asphalt shingles. Is that true? That, that is referring to, um, <clears throat> like if you use the radiant roof decking where it's glued to the roof deck, yeah, it, uh, it, the, your, the roof deck will increase the temperature a little bit. Um, and that's also an issue with the unvented attics where you have, you know, insulation right up against the roof deck. It will get a little warmer and the shingles will be a little bit warmer. So it could reduce their life about 10%. But the much, much bigger factor that affects the life of shingles is UV, it's sun. And, and, and so the color has a bigger impact than the temperature of the roof deck. And so a black roof will not last as long as a medium tone brown. And, and so that's what I would recommend if you, you know, if you're going, if you have, if you're replacing decking with radiant decking, then go with a lighter color roof, avoid the black. Or if you're going with an unvented attic, which I don't recommend generally as a retrofit, you know, just a new construction. It can be done, but it's gotta be done right. But anyway, but a radiant barrier um, the foil that is stapled to the underside of the rafters, you still get airflow between it and the deck, so it doesn't make the deck hotter. And so you maintain the soffit vent and whatever kind of ridge vents or gable vents you have, you leave a little gap at the ridge, air will flow between it and the deck, and that does not make the deck hotter. If you do mm -hmm. use radiant barrier decking, be sure that it's perforated and um, you know, especially since, you know, New Orleans is very rainy, but, but the radiant barrier under the rafters is really the safest and I think the most effective option. All right. 
Awesome. And we've got, um, what about air sealing and insulating the crawl space versus the subfloor? So I think this is more for the, at the ground level. <laughs> right. You're in New Orleans. So the Claudette <laughs> opinion is that's a dumb thing to do. From a building science <laughs> standpoint, it works, you know, to, to seal the crawl space, put heavy, heavy plastic, you know, like at least 10 mil on the ground, tape it, seal it airtight up the walls, you insulate the walls, and then you condition the space. So it's like an unvented attic only with the crawl space. So it needs to be semi-conditioned. So either you provide it some supply and return from the house, or you put a dehumidifier in there, which then has to run for it to be safe. And then you have equipment to buy, equipment to maintain, and to make sure that it doesn't stop running. And so if there's no other way to deal with the situation, that does create a dry space. But when it floods, then that space, which is coupled with your indoor air, will flood. And then you've got contaminated flood water and all the horrible stuff that's in it coupled with your indoor air. And so for that, it's risky and it's not a good idea. So in New Orleans, I would not recommend it unless you've got no other way to solve the moisture problem. If for some reason you cannot use the spray foam, you cannot install rigid foam boards underneath, but you really wanna do something, then I would suggest um, Go ahead and and seal it up and and put a, a commercial you know a dehumidifier in there with a sensor that tells you if it quits working and make a way that you can easily change the filters and 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 budget to keep replacing it when it wears. Yeah, out. yeah. The the room for error in that just seems almost it, too it high. Works. I mean, it works. <laughs> but for Come like a novice homeowner, I, I think but, the the way that these houses were designed was to have that airspace. So to include, like you said earlier, is like closing it is really not. Yeah, and you have to clean it too. You know, exactly. So, so, so you know, I mean, which is kind of a horrendous thing. And then we yeah, have the pros and cons on that. Scene. Yeah, have, and then we have critters. You know, we have termites. We have yeah. all kind of stuff that's going to chew through that plastic. So it's a system that. If there's no better solution, it works, but I don't like it because I would rather have a system that you didn't have to use energy to condition that space that, that you don't use and, and it's hard to get into. It's difficult to access, to clean, to maintain. You know, I'm more comfortable with an unvented attic because there's more room there and that's where you're putting your HVAC system anyway, you know, so you mm -hmm. can do that, particularly if you've got those old New Orleans homes that have the ductwork in the crawl space. That can make that a better solution too, because that ductwork is going to sweat. So if you seal it up and you put, you know, dehumidifier in there, then I prefer the dehumidifier to supply and return with the living space because of the flood prone, the flood issue. You know, if it floods. You lose your dehumidifier, but you're not coupling all those contaminants with your indoor air. Does that make sense? And so, um, yes, yes, it does. <laughs> I think that you gave, there's multiple options there and, and that's what's important. And I think that, like you said earlier, like looking into the other, the other insulation options is probably best. And at the maintenance yeah. for that, and, and the single and condition crawl space is is you know a very um, is is becoming you know the up and coming um, preferred system in other parts of the country right. where they have dug out crawl spaces, but they don't flood. You know they're they're high and dry, right. um, even though they're dug out. That's not us. That's right. Not New Orleans. Exactly, and that's where we're kind of. I mean, the water table is almost to the ground. You know, I mean, it's just. Um, so we don't dig out, we do raise, you know, for that right. reason, but still, exactly. we are a flood prone area. So I, that's a system that, that I would try to avoid if there's any other better solution um, in, in South Louisiana. All right. And I've got th just three quick questions, hopefully. Sure. We've got, um, is there a roof vent uh, that you find most efficient? So like a ridge vent, a powered ventilator? 
Whirly Bird, is there a combination oh, that's that you a great recommend? Question. I should have included that in the presentation. Do not use power root vents. Um, I do not recommend them. And the reason for that is one, you know, they use energy in an effort to save energy, but they really don't save energy because what they tend to do is create a negative pressure in the attic, which then does what? Pull your air conditioned air through any penetrations in the ceiling into the attic. So yeah, they make your attic cooler. You know how? By air conditioning them. <laughs> the air that you paid to cool for your living space. And so they, you know, they're, plus that can, that can also add to the um, leakage in your return. I mean, it can cause problems. So don't do a power attic vent, do a passive system. My preference um, is ridge vent, soffit vent combination that uses the natural physics of, you know, the air come in low and it, and it leave high. It gives a complete wind wash, you know, over, over the whole roof deck. And, um, and, and they do make wind tested and rated soft, uh, ridge vents now. And, and then for soffit vents, I would not use those little flimsy things that just rest in a J channel or under the roof overhang. Use rigid material like fiber cement, perforated fiber cement soffits. Or, mm -hmm. or plywood with something really attached to it. So you want your soffits to be attached to framing with fasteners because you know I've, I've seen after hurricanes, they get blown out or are pushed in and then you get wind-driven rain in the attic, the ceiling collapses, it's a huge mess. But the, the ridge vents, I think it's a, um, a TAS 100, I think is what the standard is. But basically, uh, for the ridge vents, it's a Florida rating, you know, a Florida mm -hmm. thing. But there is such a thing because there's Florida, and Florida, <laughs> you know, tends to have hurricanes too. So they do all this testing. So there are wind tested ridge vents. So look for the, I think it's a TAS 100, TA, TAS, something like that, 100 mm -hmm. uh, wind tested ridge vents and then structural soffit vents. All right, and so one more question. This is a more an interior kind of question. So okay. she says, uh, my kids sleep with their bedroom doors closed and then complain about their rooms being hot. Uh -huh. Should I open the transom windows to avoid pressure differentials? Absolutely. Now the problem with our old home transom windows is then that also lets all the light and sound through, you know, which is what, people close their doors because they want privacy, okay? <laughs> and so the, the transoms were there for a reason to allow airflow. So yes, open the transoms. The alternative to that is to install um, return air grills. You can buy commercial or you can do a do-it-yourself kind of thing through the wall or even through doors where um, they have the, the ones that you can buy commercially, we, we show them in La House. We have them everywhere in La House too, you know, in each room. Um, it's, it looks like just a grill, like you have, you know, on both sides of the wall, like a supply grill, but in between is a baffle, a sound and light baffle. So no light comes through um, and it reduces the sound transmission, but you still get the, the return airflow through. So yes, um, either leave the doors open, or open the transom, or install, um, you know, return air transfer grills. All right, perfect. And so last but not least, uh, we think we've gotten through uh, at least 20 questions and um, we had about 70 to 80 attendees tonight. So it's been a good oh. evening. And so I'm gonna leave you just with this last question here. And it is, um, Someone from out of town, I'm not in New Orleans, but I have found this information incredibly helpful. Uh, I'd like a pro to take stock of my old house, systems, and climate to help me prioritize the big ticket energy improvements. Does this service exist? What is the service called in an internet search? <laughs> yes, it exists, not for me, but, but it does. There are, <laughs> um, there are energy consultants and energy raiders um, there are two national organizations. One is called ResNet, R-E-S-N-E-T, 
And those um, and and people who get certified by ResNet can do total home energy ratings. They tend to focus more on new construction, but they can do existing homes too. Um, and they have the testing equipment as well, and they can do cost benefit analysis with software. There's also another organization called BPI, the Building Performance Institute, and they are a <clears throat> a testing and certification organization for people who, um, with a focus more on existing homes. So folks with a BPI certification, they have different ones. You know, one is about the building envelope, another, they might get another one about, you know, HVAC, they might get another one about different things. Now, the, the issue I have with BPI is their, their certification and their tests are kind of cold climate biased. And so they, you know, mm -hmm. they, they don't necessarily have all the building science for the hot, humid climate, you know, totally at their fingertips, but they still know a lot more than, you know, the general, the general contractor. There's also um, some out there that don't have these certifications, but they just, you know, have, have um, taken building science kinds of, of programs, you know, and, and they do this work. And so they, they are energy consultants. Some of them, um, may actually, there may be programs associated with some utility companies. Some of the major utility companies may offer um, audits. And then the department, um, you know, EPA and their Energy Star program has various programs uh, for existing homes as well. And they offer those things that I showed you where you can do kind of some self-assessment for free, you know, yourself. So ResNet, BPI, um, energy consultants with other kind of, of building science background. And there are some contractors out there who, if they call themselves home performance contractors, they have a more holistic um, expertise and approach to, to making energy improvements in a home. You know, the industry is in our area is mostly they're insulation contractors. They're HVAC contractors. There are a few who might do air sealing, but there's no one who really looks at the total interrelationship of these. And if you, if you do one thing without knowing anything about the others, you can really cause problems, you know, with moisture right. or with air quality. And so the home performance contractor, if you can find one wherever you are, um, they would have a, you know, they, they would, could do more analysis. So there are some insulation contractors and some HVAC contractors that have kind of expanded out into more of the home performance level of service. Awesome. Again, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time tonight to, to do this presentation and answer all the questions we had um, and for being with us. <laughs> well, it was um, my pleasure and I hope it helps some folks stay comfortable this summer without breaking the bank. That, yes. that was the whole objective. <laughs> Thank you. And our um, this recording will be available on our YouTube page. So if everybody anybody needs to go back and check out our presentation and any of the recommendations made tonight, please check out our YouTube page or our peer, our, our video um, library at the PRCNO.org website. And right. visit La House Resource Center yes. website. Lots of free information and resources. Absolutely. We need to make our way up there. Alrighty. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a good evening.